the court, Andy. That'd be Uh, if you're all comfortable with that, accept it when it pops up on your screen. Um, I would like to take the moment to welcome everybody here today. Uh, this is a really great turnout, as we rather expected it might be. Um, and I uh, would like to welcome you to the first of what will be five meetings uh, about this issue. And if you don't mind, or Jeff, if you don't mind moving the slide. So, um, I'm going to do the the um, kind of the process part first. I uh, get all of the ground rules out on the table, and then we'll move into uh, the next part of this, uh, which is by now many of us, if not all of us, have been participating in Zoom meetings. Um, so you're familiar with the setup. Uh, this particular format is a webinar format. Um, I will say um, that as an attendee, I can appreciate if this. Um, is a little bit frustrating at a, on occasion. Um, we did consider once we'd um, already sent out the invite, we did consider altering the format, but we realized uh, pretty quickly that having multiple uh, links out there was going to be even more frustrating for people. So uh, work with us through this. We're gonna have a couple opportunities for you to engage. Um, You've been muted upon entrance. Uh, when the time comes for testimony and you're someone who's testifying, uh, we will unmute you and you'll receive a, uh, I believe you'll receive a little note that asks you to then follow through uh, with that on your end. Um, we've got a couple ways that we're gonna um, try to engage with folks. Um, we will be using chat to ask clarifying questions. We will not be accepting public testimony through chat. Um, so a clarifying question would be, um, could you repeat that date again? Or could you remind us uh, what that enforceable policy was one more time? Uh, things that help uh, kind of keep the train moving down the tracks. Those are the kind of questions that we'll be accepting and answering through chat. Um, with chat, you'll notice that it is only going to come to the host and the panelists. So the folks that you see on the screen right now, those are the folks that are going to be able to see your chat. It's not available to the rest of the um, participants um, in the audience. Uh, we are also going to be, uh, when the time comes for testimony, and we'll, we'll talk about that again, but just starting to get people prepared. Uh, when the time comes for testimony, we're going to use the raise hand feature. And if you aren't familiar with uh, Zoom, I'm not certain what type of format you're on right now, but on a laptop, for example, you're going to see that uh, you've got a line of icons down at the bottom and you're going to see a, one that includes chat. And when you go in there, um, it's going to limit who you can see um, and who you can speak with. Um, but that will come directly to us. Uh, we're also going to have a opportunity to use what is called a question and answer um, tool. And that's also down at the bottom of your screen and it's Q&A. That's how it will present itself. Um, we'll let you know when that's gonna open up. Um, we're also going to be um, strongly encouraging folks who do provide oral testimony today to also consider submitting written testimony. Um, it is, um, it is a way for you to flesh out your thoughts. You're gonna have three minutes today. So um, a written opportunity gives you a lot more time to uh, really be thoughtful about how you'd like to expand on your, on your points and make sure that we've got the full uh, breadth of what it is you're trying to convey to us. Uh, we've had about a half an hour of uh, presentations uh, to start with. We'll move into the testimony phase and then, oh, uh, let me rephrase that. Andy, you're going first, correct? Yes. Uh, so we're going to start this off with, if you want to move it, uh, the next slide, Andy. Um, if you want to um, uh, uh, learn a little bit more about something that many of you, if you've been engaged in this conversation before this, uh, you've probably heard of something about an offshore wind uh, energy map, road map. Um, we're going to talk about that briefly. Andy's going to talk to that today. Uh, that is not what this meeting is about, but we thought we'd take advantage of the opportunity to have so many people in attendance 
to let you know what's going to be coming down the road. I do not want this to get confused with the hearing portion of this, but this is really um, yet one more piece of the puzzle of, of how offshore wind moves through uh, the processes for the state of Oregon and local jurisdictions. So this is informational only. Um, then we're going to move into the actual reason for our visit today, which is uh, to talk about an application from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management that is in front of us. And we are here to ask for your input, your testimony on this. You'll hear a lot more about this um, when Jeff comes on to describe the process and, and what it is we're looking for from you. And as I mentioned, each of you are going to have three minutes. Uh, we're going to hold to that. You can imagine if all of the folks online right now want to speak, um, three minutes is already a long time. Uh, so again, that's why I encourage any written comments. If you feel you don't get what you need uh, said today, put it in writing. Um, and then we're going to ask uh, any more questions you know, at the end, just for any clarification, if we want to move to the next slide. And this is just the... Um, kind of the, the road show that we're putting on right now. So this is our first meeting on this matter. Um, and it is the only virtual meeting. The rest will be in person and will be in person only. And so you can see we're going to be in Brookings on June 3rd, uh, Coos Bay on June 4th, and then we'll have a day of, of rest. And really, it's mostly travel. And then we'll be in Florence on June 6th. And uh, we'll wrap it up with um, a visit in Newport on June 7th. Um, so, uh, again, I encourage you to come to these if you're from the coast or if you need a reason to come to the coast, this is as good as any. Um, and, uh, we will then move, uh, from here and our welcome into, uh, the first part of this presentation, which is just going to be this informational piece about the roadmap. I'm going to take one quick second to take a look at the chat to see if there were any questions about what I said. And I do not believe that uh, there's anything in there for me So um, and for us. So I'm going to hand this over to Andy now. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Lanier. I'm the Marine Affairs Coordinator for DLCD. Um, I'm going to give you uh, an orientation on the Oregon roadmap for offshore wind. Jeff, go ahead. Next slide. Uh, before I do so, um, we did want to make it possible for everyone to be able to see each other or at least who was registered. And so, uh, Mandy, go ahead and post the registration list into the chat. Uh, this will be linked as a file. So if you'd like to see those who have registered, um, we don't have everyone who has registered. Right now we have uh, 77 participants totaling panelists and attendees. Uh, so. Uh, but you should be able to see a good cross-section of, of who signed up to join us today. Andy, I think you're going to have to post it because um, okay. it's stating that I'm not host any longer and can't. So I have sent it to you. We will do that soon then. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Next slide. In the 2024 legislative session, uh, the Oregon legislature passed House Bill 4080 related to offshore wind. Um, this was originally a bill focused on the inclusion of labor standards applicable to offshore wind projects, but was expanded to include the concept of an Oregon offshore wind roadmap. DLCD was directed to take the lead on the state engagement associated with the, the generation or the production of a roadmap for the state. And at the same time, we were also tasked with doing the work to evaluate the entire suite of Oregon enforceable policies that could be brought to bear on the question of offshore wind developments. And that list of enforceable policies not only includes uh, the things that relate to ocean uses and resources, but also any elements of a project that may be connected onshore um, or across Oregon's territorial sea. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff. 
I would like to recognize the hard work of a group of Oregon citizens that came together and had a conversation. Um, they were from different walks of life, different perspectives, um, and the leadership of the group reflected that. And I want to specifically call out uh, the three kind of co-leads of this informal group. Uh, they included Ranfis Giannettino Viatoro from Blue Green Alliance, Nicole Hughes from Renewable Northwest, and Heather Mann, uh, director of the Midwater Trawl Trawlers Cooperative. These three individuals came from very different perspectives, but brought a, a group of people together to share in a conversation, an opportunity to learn, to ask questions, to state concerns, uh, with the potential of the offshore wind industry to intersect with, with Oregon communities and Oregon places. Um, and what they have done is to create an initial set of considerations associated with offshore wind. And the group envisioned a roadmap applying to the full extent of what may be present as a part of an offshore wind development, in including both uh, state and federal waters off of the Oregon coast, as well as onshore. So in our estuaries or any other onshore related infrastructure needed to support and transmit energy that may be collected and generated offshore. Um, the group also envisioned the full life cycle of floating offshore wind development being a part of the discussions. So planning, siting, development, operations, maintenance, and decommissioning are all elements of how a potential industry may interact with the existing communities in the state of Oregon. And lastly, you know, the group wanted to understand and think about Oregon's strategic role as it relates to offshore wind, both in policy, research, and the business of floating offshore wind, either nationally or globally. Next slide, please. So uh, the group kind of concluded its efforts earlier this year. In uh, late March, early April, they uh, published the document, which is uh, pictured here on the right. It is available for download, and the group also held an informational uh, webinar about that, and the recording of it is available, as well as kind of the documentation of the group um, that is provided by the Oregon Consensus uh, website. So you can see who was a part of the, the group and follow the work that, that they have completed. But while this is a great launching off point, it is not the end all be all of the creation of a roadmap. And we, the, the state of Oregon, envision a comprehensive process to do that. Jeff, next slide, please. And the directives in House Bill 4080 give us kind of our guideposts for the things that we want to incorporate or will need to incorporate in our roadmap to meet the um, legislative intent. And that is that, you know, the roadmap shall identify and define standards to be considered in the processes related to offshore wind development review and or approval. And those standards are related to stakeholder engagement, um, especially with local and regional coastal communities, the opportunities that, that may derive from the generation of an offshore wind uh, workforce and set of investments that may result in offshore wind projects, as well as the potential challenge of fitting a new use into our existing communities, right? So understanding the economic opportunities while we are sustaining those existing local and regional economies. So how can we fit this in together in a way that's consistent with our policies and the plans that the state of Oregon has? Uh, they, they also direct us to consider and think about how an offshore wind workforce would be trained and housed and an equitable way of doing so. And then it, they ask us to think about the kinds of resources that you know, we want to call out and identify um, for protection. And goal 19 is our state's ocean resource policy goal. Uh, so we will certainly take a look at what 
that directs us to do in terms of protection of the environment and marine species that are identified in Goal 19, as well as uh, tribal and cultural archaeological resources or culturally significant view sheds, as well as any other uh, interests that may be presented to us through tribal consultation. And lastly, how does this fit within the state of Oregon's broad policy goals on energy and, and climate? So uh, no small ask. We certainly envision a comprehensive process to hear from our state and, and communities in our state about that. Uh, so Jeff, if you go to the next slide, we'll get to a little bit of our early thinking about this. Um, so the legislation passed in, in March. Uh, we at DLCD are still in the process of kind of spinning up to do our hiring. At the same time, obviously, we are in the midst of our federal consistency review for the first leases off of Oregon's Outer Continental Shelf. And so uh, we envision being very busy until the completion of our review, um, after which we really are going to begin making progress on the work to develop the roadmap. We envision engagement with stakeholders happening in a number of different ways. One of which is that you know, we are planning to stand up an offshore wind advisory work group. Um, this may be like a successor to the informal group that was uh, established, but with additional uh, slots for other representation um, from which we've heard that there is a need. Uh, we also will be um, committed to ongoing tribal coordination and consultation as requested by Oregon's federally recognized tribal governments. And lastly, uh, we do envision a broad public engagement, and this is really targeted at both communities of place and communities of practice. And when I say that, I, obviously the uh, Southern Oregon coast would provide sources of uh, community of place that may be impacted, um, as well as communities of practice. So users that may use or interact with uh, the geographies that may be um, initially targeted or eventually identified as potentially being more suitable. Right, so we do envision focus groups, public meetings, uh, potentially public surveys, et cetera, to help inform us as we develop the roadmap. And uh, we are aiming for completion of the roadmap in the summer, end of the summer, 2025 or early fall. We have a legislative report due to the uh, legislature in September of 2025. Um, so that is really our, our last benchmark there. And Jeff, go to the next slide. Now I'm going to provide the context of the roadmap within our existing um, offshore wind energy leasing process that is um, convened by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And the first thing that I want to mention about this graphic is um, there are tasks on the, the blue timeline that are, are associated with BOEM actions or activities. Those are kind of the bottom half of the timeline, whereas actions that are conducted by a private company or an interest that actually secures a lease would happen on the top of the timeline. We envision our work on the roadmap happening to develop it in the, the next year, year and a half of time. But there will be projects that we identify, there will be actions and or technical working groups that might be established that are a direct result of the completion of the roadmap. And those would be necessary to act on prior to the point in time at which the state actually receives a proposal for a project or a construction and operations plan, right? So we do have at least you know, a little over a year for development, plus potentially up to four years for implementation of the roadmap, as that is a, a rough estimate of 
the time that it may take for a company to complete their assessments and design a project and actually develop the construction operations plan, which will be what the state and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management then reviews in their next regulatory review phase. So the takeaway here is that we do have some time to work on the development of the roadmap and on and the implementation of actions identified by the roadmap that could then have an impact on a project review at the later stage. And some of those actions may be the development of new enforceable policies that the state would have in order to ask the question of whether or not the proposal is consistent with Oregon's enforceable policies of our federally approved coastal management program. Jeff, next slide. Uh, so we have begun putting some information resources online associated with the roadmap. Um, we have generated a new listserv. Um, this is the official place where we will be sending out emails and announcements about our roadmap activities. It will also be the place where uh, you could access uh, once our federal consistency decision is done, uh, that information. So uh, stay tuned for more on this effort. You know, we uh, intend to really begin in earnest following the completion of our uh, federal, re federal consistency review process. And one last little note here that I'll, I'll put as a teaser, um, nominations for serving on our offshore wind advisory group will be announced coming soon. So uh, we will be looking for individuals to self-nominate or to nominate others in their communities that uh, they feel would be appropriate to help the state by participating with us on an advisory group. So uh, Jeff, I think I'm turning it over to you on the next one. You are, but Andy, I'm just gonna step in for a second because I think you can address this question. Um, can you please share websites as well? So we've got the QR codes up. Is it also possible to put that in the chat for people to grab? Yes, yeah, I will. I, I can do that as soon as I'm done here. Okay, great. Okay, Jeff, now it's all yours. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Jeff Burright. I work in the Coastal Management Program as the State Federal Relations Coordinator, which means that I am responsible for coordinating the federal consistency reviews of projects and action by federal agencies in the coastal zone. Uh, and so I'm here to talk to you about what federal consistency is and the part that it has to play on the action that is currently before us uh, to hopefully give you some good background before we get into the public hearing testimony phase of today. Just briefly, the Oregon Coastal Management Program um, is administered by DLCD. Um, we are a federally recognized program, as Andy mentioned, and we serve in a number of different ways. Uh, we support the development of policies at the local level and the state level um, that relate to coastal health. And we have the Federal Consistency Authority, which is what I'm here to talk with you about today. We also are a networked program in that we work together with a number of state agencies, as well as cities and counties in the coastal zone, who all have a piece of this program under our respective umbrellas, uh, whether that be um, being the, the owners and experts of certain policies or just an interest in certain uses or resources in the coast. And we all work together uh, to, to further those goals. So why are we here today? Um, on a macro level, we're here today because, as I said, I want to explain what the Federal Consistency Review Authority is and describe to you the specifics of the action that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is proposing to take. Uh, I want to explain to you what the state's role in this review is and, and how that role is governed by certain standards and processes that we are going to 
be bound to follow. Um, but then really what we want to have today be about is to have you have an opportunity to talk with us and each other about how you view this action relative to the policies of the state coastal program and to give us an opportunity to hear that feedback and consider it as we are actively undergoing our review now. What is a federal consistency review? Uh, <clears throat> the, the federal consistency authority came out of the Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972, which recognized that actions taken by the federal government can have an effect on the uses and resources of individual states, coastal zones, and spheres of, of interest. And as a result, the Coastal Zone Management Act created this provision called the Federal Consistency Authority. It's a federal process with, with federal backing in which the states participate. And what it does is give the states a seat at the table whenever there is a federal action, such as you know, taking an action of their own volition or a federal permit or license issued to uh, an applicant. That in either one of those cases, if there is a foreseeable effect to state coastal uses and resources, the state has an opportunity to review that action and to compare the effects of that action against the enforceable policies that that coastal management program has adopted and had formalized through the NOAA Office for Coastal Management for use in these reviews. And as has been explained to me since the day I arrived at this job, the Federal Consistency Authority is really meant to be a, a tool for coordination, an ability for states, federal agencies, and applicants to try to work together to come to agreement on actions that are consistent with state policies. The effects that would trigger a Federal Consistency Review are fairly broad in their scope. Um, as you can see along the bottom of the slide here, there are a number of different types of effects that may be considered that would be um, applicable, that would bring in this federal consistency review. And it requires that the effect be reasonably foreseeable, and it allows that the effect can be indirect or cumulative in nature. And so when we are considering the effects that we then compared to our enforceable policies, there's a broad swath that we can consider. When we undergo a federal consistency review of a federal agency activity, which is what we're here to talk about today, the BOEM issuance of leases of the Outer Continental Shelf, that is a, a federal agency taking an action of its own volition. It triggers a subpart C process in the federal process that we follow. And the, the major steps of that process are that the federal agency submits to the state what's known as a consistency determination. This is where they describe the effects of the action that they want to take, and they compare that action against the state's enforceable policies and seek the state's concurrence that the action is consistent. Once the state receives this consistency determination document, that begins our our formal review period. The regulations allow us to have 60 days as a standard period with the ability to extend an extra 15 days. And we've already invoked that. So we are going to have a 75 day review of this action, which began on April 30th, I believe. It, it ends on July 14th. Uh, we typically do a 30 day public review and comment period with our federal consistency reviews. In this case, we decided to also extend that another 15 days. So that period ends on June 15th. And that was just within our discretion to do and we wanted to do it. Uh, and then at the end of that process, we would issue a decision to the federal agency where we either concur, concur with conditions or object to the action that has been proposed. So here you can see again the outcome. In the event of a state decision to concur, what that means is the state agrees with the federal agency that the action as proposed is consistent with the state's enforceable policies. And when it's a subpart C action, it's consistent to the maximum extent practicable. 
Uh, when it's a concurrence with conditions, that's similar to a yes if kind of decision where we say this action is consistent provided that the federal agency agrees to certain additional measures. Uh, and those have to be agreed upon between the state and the federal agency. If those conditions are not accepted, then it turns into an objection. And so that third category of outcomes would be if the state were to decide that the action as proposed and its effects are not consistent with state enforceable policies, the action would then not be able to move forward unless the federal agency makes a determination for itself that it believes that it was consistent to the maximum extent practicable. There's a period of, of mediation, negotiation, trying to work it out if, if that situation occurs. And the, the state's remedy at that point would be to um, challenge that in court. In addition, when we began our federal consistency review period, we published a public notice on our website. Um, hopefully some of you were able to find that. We also issued a notice on our email listserv, uh, which you saw the, the link to sign up for that earlier, and we'll show that again. Um, within our public notice, we also uh, highlight that there is a public comment opportunity and we give some guidance on how to craft an effective comment, and we'll talk some more about that later. I did want to acknowledge that in this moment in time, there are currently three different processes undergoing review. And we are responsible for, excuse me, that, that blue arrow along the bottom. That is our federal consistency review. BOEM has also issued a proposed sale notice on the same day, which runs until the end of June. And there's also the environmental assessment under NEPA that BOEM has put forward. I believe its current deadline is the end of May, but I, I think I'd heard at their task force meeting that they're looking to extend that as well. But our decision is due on July 14th again, and our public comment period closes on June 15th. Now let's talk about the action itself. Uh, what is happening here is that earlier this year, BOEM identified two wind energy areas on the outer continental shelf in federal waters. Uh, one that they have called the Coos Bay Wea, uh, wind energy area and the Brookings wind energy area. And within those areas, now BOEM is proposing to issue leases to private companies that would allow them to go out in those areas and begin doing site assessments and studies toward the development of a construction and operations plan that they would submit to BOEM in, I'll say, five years. So that is the action that BOEM has put forward to the state, is the issuance of the leases and then the survey activities that would follow. I want to emphasize, however, that this is not the state's only opportunity to review the BOEM uh, wind energy development process, nor is this a decision to permit the actual construction of a project. So what you can see on the left is the review that we have undertaken right now, which is the review of the lease decision itself. And then following the years of site assessment and surveys, when BOEM is considering whether to approve a construction and operations plan to actually allow a project to move forward, the state gets a second opportunity to also review that decision and compare it against our enforceable policies. And here's just another way to look at it, the two touch points of federal consistency. We're there in touch point one with the lease sale and with the effects that we can reasonably foresee at this time being that the lessees would do those resource assessment surveys. Touch point two would be the construction operations plan where we would look much in greater detail about what is actually proposed to be built there and what is the plan for the years of operation of that facility. As I mentioned before, our review initiated when BOEM submitted a consistency determination document to us. That document is available on our website. It is, I'll, I'll call it the centerpiece of our review, because that's the place where BOEM described their activities and then specifically went policy by policy 
of the enforceable policies of the state that are applicable to the action they're taking. And they provided a justification or an explanation why they believe the action is consistent with that policy. If I were a member of the public looking to approach this decision and try to understand how to dig in, I would recommend this is the place to start. Uh, this consistency determination is also supported by the information that's in the environmental assessment that is out for concurrent review. And so they're, they're a bit of, uh, I don't know, they, they um, complement one another. As well, BOEM has put out draft leases, and there is some detail and information in those that could be helpful to fully understand the action taking place. I found it helpful to draw a cartoon of what is actually inside the scope of this review and what is not in scope. Because unfortunately, it's not totally straightforward. And this is uh, an outcome of the different overlapping authorities out in the ocean. So Boehm has the authority to approve actions in federal waters to the left of that dark blue line. And the action that they have put forward for review is to issue a lease in that dark blue lease block and within that area, they anticipate that lessees would put out oceanographic buoys, so met buoys that would be anchored to the seafloor for a period of five years or so. And then conducting vessel surveys within that area, including geophysical surveys such as side scan sonar, um, getting the geophysical information about the bottom conditions, geotechnical surveys, which are where they're actually, for lack of a better term, poking holes in, in the seafloor to try to understand more information about what's under the seafloor surface. Uh, and then biological surveys to understand what is living out there and what could potentially be affected by a future project. They would conduct some similar activities outside of the lease block. So as they're searching for places to lay cables to shore, and that would again involve geotechnical and geophysical surveys, uh, wildlife surveys, and then just vessel transiting activities would have an effect. So we are able to review the entirety of that action in federal waters against our enforceable policies. And we can also review what effects there might be in state waters that result from the things that are happening out in federal waters. So that includes vessel transit, um, any potential nearshore impacts from what's happening out there. Um, visual resource effects, port utilization, et cetera, et cetera. So that is within the, the review authority. I borrow this slide from the Bowen presentation from last week because I thought it gave a, a good visualization of the types of activities that would be tangible results of the leasing action at this stage. So that includes the MET buoys, work from vessels to collect samples of the seafloor, as well as doing visual or using different means to, to really understand what's what's going on down there. But there's another piece to this that is not within the scope of this review, and that includes activities that may also occur in state waters, because we expect that over the next five years, these lessees would be trying to find a cable corridor that goes all the way to shore. So we do expect that there would be similar types of activities from vessels, you know, collecting samples, trying to understand the, the geophysical nature of the seafloor, and as well as potentially activities that happen on the shore or in upland areas as they try to understand where they might be able to bring cables to connect to the grid. Those activities, because BOEM does not have authority within state waters, their, their justification for why they've not included this is that they don't have the ability to approve or deny these activities. That's within the purview of the Army Corps of Engineers who would issue a permit for anything that has seafloor contact, as well as there are existing state permits and authorities that would come into play and could potentially take the lead on some of these actions as well. So there would be a sequence of additional reviews that might come on down the line related to activities within the state jurisdiction. I'm going to talk now about what our standard of review will be, and we've used this term enforceable policies a number of times today. What that really means is a subset of laws and rules and plans, policies 
that are already on the books and enforceable within the state, but that have a, a specific enforceable language to them and that meet criteria at the federal level to be used in these types of reviews. The coastal program is continuously going through the state laws and rules and including the local uh, comprehensive plans and codes, pulling out those enforceable policies and submitting them to the NOAA Office for Coastal Management for use and review. And we have a list on our website of all of the current enforceable policies. I wanna show you, this is a way to visualize them as kind of a pictograph. And here on the screen, you can see that we have uh, the statewide land use planning goals, that those are part of our coastal program and would apply. That includes goal 19 for ocean resources, which Andy mentioned earlier. We have state statutes, uh, most commonly related to natural resources and Oregon administrative rules that go along with. We have the territorial sea plan, which uh, implements goal 19, as well as local county and city policies that are part of the coastal program. This action specifically, however, what we've determined is that not the entire suite of our enforceable policies applies because the action is constrained to just those activities happening out in federal waters and then the extent to which we can foresee that there might be effects inshore. So we, uh, we expect that statewide planning goals 1, 5, 6, and 19 do apply to this action. Territorial Sea Plan Part 2 applies to the action. And then there are several uh, state statutes and their, their accompanying rules that relate to wildlife, commercial fishing and fishery requirements. There are environmental quality statutes related to hazardous waste, air quality, water quality. Um, we also have policies specifically related to archeological resources and the protection of them. And I would call these key enforceable policies that we're using in our review. Just to pull out some, I think, even more key within the key policies, some language that we look to. If you look to goal 19, for example, it places a priority on the protection of renewable marine resources. And we don't mean renewable energy, we mean living marine organisms. And so there are some more specific policies within goal 19, but this is, I think, a, a pretty powerful basis for our review. I also wanted to acknowledge and highlight that there are policies related to wildlife protection, as well as policies that apply to food fish management. So that the fisheries themselves that can be brought to bear in this review. However, there are some policies that based on our review so far, we've determined don't apply yet to this action. That includes part four of the territorial sea plan related to uh, the placement of subsea cables. And the reason why that doesn't apply yet is because BOEM is not actually proposing any cable routes at this point. This is the investigation phase. And those cable routes, they've assured us, would not be designated or approved until that construction operations plan five years from now. So that's when this policy would apply. Similarly, Territorial Sea Plan Part 5 has standards that apply to marine renewable energy development to the facilities themselves, which would include the wind energy platforms, any substations, et cetera. But because BOEM is not proposing a renewable energy project right now, that doesn't come into play yet, but we know that it will. There are also statutes related to the ocean shore that we think are not directly applicable to this action because BOEM can't approve activities within state jurisdiction, uh, as well as local government plans and codes because those policies don't apply offshore. And so unless there is a direct effect on the inshore environment as a result of the activities offshore, they don't apply. As I will emphasize, they don't apply yet. We do expect that they will, and we are making sure that it is well known with BOEM and eventually if there are lessees with them, that these are all policies that need to be factored in as they're developing their projects. We're almost to the point where we're going to open this up for um, public testimony, but I've received some questions from some of you out there. Um, we recognize that this is kind of a difficult process to come into and understand how to make effective comments. 
Um, you know, enforceable policies are kind of intricate and complex. The action itself has kind of a complicated scope. And so we wanted to offer some guidance for you all as you prepare to speak today about the kinds of comments that, that can make the most difference for us during our review. And I would ask to, to focus on the action being reviewed. And I've gone, that's why I've emphasized the scope of this action. Um, at, to the extent you can, to focus on the enforceable policies themselves. And so for example, say, I believe this action or a part of this action is consistent or is not consistent with goal 19 because of X, Y, Z reason. Um, and that gets to what is the effect? What is the effect that, that is of greatest concern to you that may not comport with an enforceable policy and that deserves the state's attention? And then that final piece would be, if there is an effect that has a potential to be inconsistent with a policy, are there any conditions or actions that Boehm or a lessee could take that could address that concern, that effect? to make the action consistent. Uh, Andy had shown these QR codes previously, but I do want to uh, again highlight that our public comment period is open until June 15th. Our decision is due July 14th. And when we do issue a decision, we would post that on our website, put out a notice on our listserv so, so you will be informed as to what comes next. So Jeff, we've yes. got three questions in the question and answer box. Okay. And for the benefit of the few folks that are on the on the phone, um, would it help? I'll just read them out loud to you and you can also follow along, but that way they can hear them. But okay. uh, we have, the first one is in this process, will you take into account the thousands of previous written comments to Bone? Well, I would, hmm. I think that for the formal process itself, if there are comments that you think were really pertinent that you wanna make sure the state notices, I would ask you to make a public comment during this process pointing to that comment. And that would be an effective way to essentially bring it into this review. Um, I will say that I've gone through and looked at those comments as, you know, as someone who's been following this as well, but that I don't believe our process allows to, to incorporate by reference comments that have come before. No, may I just tag on to that really quick? Um, if, if you, uh, if anyone on this call or anyone who watches this uh, at a later time, if you provided written comments to Bohm and you feel like they're relevant to the the issue in front of us today, which is this very specific application, nothing precludes you from sending us those comments. Um, uh, but we will not go back through uh, the Balm comments that they received. That's a different. That's a different process, a different agency, a different need for which they were soliciting those comments. So, um, but you can certainly forward comments that you've sent previously to other agencies to us uh, to. Uh, provide your point of view on this issue. Uh, and then Jeff, we have two more, but they, I'm gonna kind of read them together. Um, oh, they're popping up. Uh, shouldn't the scope of consistency review encompass all reasonably foreseeable connected actions, including those not directly under BOM, BOM authority? I'm gonna break them off. I think I'll stop there. Um. <laughs> I will say that that was the uh, position that I initially took with this review, uh, that I was an advocate that all of those activities happening in the state be part of this review. Um, I have discussed it with Boehm. I've also discussed it with the NOAA Office for Coastal Management. And the the what I got from those conversations was that if Boehm doesn't have the authority to affect those things that are happening within the state jurisdiction, but that those activities would be covered, you know, some other way that you know, the, the feedback was essentially, this is the scope that Boehm has put forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, by all means, if, if there are effects that you are concerned about related to in-state activities, 
don't limit yourself when you're making comments to us. Great. Uh, the next one is the approval process appears to be fragmented into several phases. When are the cumulative effects of the whole package considered? When you when you say whole package, I, I would ask what you mean. I'll I'll assume for the sake of this answer that what you mean is the entire the entirety of a project that is encompassed within a lease. That would happen at the construction and operations plan phase. And at that decision, the state would be able to consider any known or foreseeable cumulative effects at that time. But I'll give you an example. If there is a project that is proposed within a specific lease area, I don't know that we have the information to suppose what the cumulative effects would be if say the entirety of federal waters were developed, that would be something that would happen at the progress of time. And if there were multiple projects, each successive project would have to be considered in the entirety of what exists or, or what is reasonably foreseeable to exist at that time when the decision is made. Great. And then the last question in the Q&A is beyond TS Territorial Sea Plan Part 4, can you characterize other applicable and forceful policies of the Territorial Sea Plan and how they do or don't apply or may or may not? Um, I, I tried to answer that in my list of, of what doesn't apply. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Part 2 of the Territorial Sea Plan is, and Andy, please correct me if I if I misspeak on any of this, uh, applies generally to uses of the C4. And so we would expect that to apply to this action. Part three, uh, which addresses Rocky Shores, we do believe that it is applicable to this action to the extent that any activities happening in federal waters might have an effect on Rocky Shores. Um, you know, there, there is a, a distance separation there. And so there, that has to be taken into account. But as I mentioned before, because this action is not proposing a energy facility, so it's not proposing platforms or substations on the water, and because it's not proposing cable routes for the installation of cables, we don't believe those apply yet, that those would apply at a later time. Great. Uh, and then there is one more, and this is uh, a fairly quick one. Is there a public review, is there public review rather at the COP stage? Yes, there would be an EIS that, excuse me, an environmental impact statement under NEPA that accompanies a construction operations plan. So that would be the BOEM federal level, uh, but then there would be a state federal consistency review. It would have a public comment period. So there, there would be review at that stage. Similar to what we're, Yes. going through right now, <clears throat> but a little longer because it might be a private entity as the applicant versus the federal Thank government. You. Yes, good point. Uh, when it is a federal permit or license, the standard period of review is six months. But as we saw in a recent major pro project review, I guess it's less recent now, but the Jordan Cove liquid natural gas project, for example, that review extended, I want to say maybe a year and a half because there were information needs along the way where the state couldn't make a decision until that information was available. And so it, it resulted in a longer review period. Right. Um, I want to note that in the chat, we received a request to provide a um, a link to the statewide planning goals. We've talked a little bit about goal 19, which is the dominant uh, goal uh, in terms of the question in front of us today, but you'll see in the chat for folks on, online that there is a link that will take you to all 19 of the statewide planning goals. Thank you, Andy. And it does appear we got one more um, uh, question um, before we move into the testimony. And um, how will visual impacts be constituted, rather, how will visual impacts be considered at this stage or later stage by DLCD? Well, I can't speak to the later stage yet, um, in part because we don't we don't have a project to review, but also because we have the roadmap that Andy spoke about earlier. And so 
We don't yet know what policies might apply then. Mm -hmm. um, at this stage, I believe, oh gosh, is it goal five that relates to visual resources? I, I need to double check that. Um, but I'll just say bottom line, the activities that Boehm is proposing are 18 to 30 miles offshore and would have the, I think the largest visual profile would be like a meteorological buoy. And those are fairly small in nature. And I, I don't believe that they would be visible from shore. There would be vessel activities that would be visible that would be not unlike vessel activities that already occur in the ocean space. Um, but if there are visual effects of concern to you, I would ask you again to make a comment that we can consider as part of our review. Great. And we did have one more comment, and this is a great question. Uh, what will be the structure of the in-person meetings happening on the coast next week compared to this virtual session? Lisa, would you like me to feel that? Sure. Or would you like to? Uh, well, we can both do this. Uh, it's going to be similar. Uh, except we're going to start the evening out and they'll, they'll all be evening meetings. We'll start the evening out with us about a half hour open house, a much um, less formal um, opportunity to um, uh, interact with uh, folks in the room, whether it's ourselves or others who are sharing some of the um, uh, same concerns or hopes that that you all have. And then we'll move into a similar structure of presentations. And when the time comes for testimony, just like in a in a uh, traditional land use hearing process, we'll have folks come up to the front of the room and uh, provide their testimony. It will still be three minutes like it will be today. We're expecting full rooms, as you can imagine, um, and also accepting written comment at that point in time as well. We will have a brief overview of the roadmap just to kind of keep people informed of where we are in our process, uh, the presentation that Jeff provided just now, and then the public testimony. Anything you want to add, Jeff? Uh, we are intending to record the comments that are made, um, and we're, we're working on the technological solution to transcribe those so that we can fully incorporate those in a review as well. Okay. And it looks like we're getting ready to move into the public testimony piece of this. Lisa, I wanted to clarify whether uh, Heather Mann, who has her hand raised, has a, a question she wanted to ask uh, verbally. Um, I did not get a response. Okay, well. Um... Oh, I see your Heather, Heather, your hand dropped. Okay, um, great. Sorry okay. now. <laughs> We've all done that, Heather. Okay, <laughs> so we're going to move into the into the public comment portion of this meeting now. Um, we're going to ask that you raise your hand. Uh, there's a example there on the slide, as well as uh, when you look at the base of your screen and where you see the mute, the video, the questions and answers. You'll also see a little raise hand. Symbol. When you raise that, it will notify us and put you in the queue, um, and it should put people in the order that they've um, raised their hand. Um, uh, you'll be called on to speak. Um, you'll be unmuted. Uh, Andy, very happy that this was in the um, a slide. If you're on the line, if you're on a call, um, and you want to raise your hand, you're on a phone you have to do star nine, and that will notice us that you are um, interested in testifying. If you have any questions or you're having trouble at any point during this part, please just shoot us a note on a uh, chat, uh, or uh, you'll see here online um, to andy.lanier, L-A-N-I-E-R, at dlcd.oregon.gov if you need some technical assistance. When you provide your presentation, we'll need your full name and affiliation. And we're going to ask, and I, we're going to be a little bit of a taskmaster about this. We're going to ask that you stay within the time limits um, about 15 seconds before it's time for you to um, wrap up. I'm going to I'm going to let you know, especially if it seems like you're just starting to get a full head of steam. Uh, I'm going to give you a little moment to collect yourself. Um, and then we'll we'll um, unmute, then we'll mute, and we'll move on to the next person. 
as always, we expect folks to speak um, respectfully. Uh, land use is very passionate. This issue is very passionate, and we all recognize that. Um, but I also want you all to be very respectful of everybody else in the room, um, and I expect them to be respectful of you. So um, uh, please note that uh, if you start to go a little off, um, we may mute you, and I don't want to do that. I want everyone to have the full three minutes to speak and get their viewpoints across. This is important. That's why we're here today, and that's why we're going out to the coast next week. So we will have a time up. You're not just, you don't just have to decide when three minutes is up all by yourself. We're going to put a timer up and uh, your name will be called. And when you start to speak, not when you're called, when you start to speak, the timer will be set and um, triggered. And then you'll see again at the three minute mark, uh, it will go off. We have just a couple seconds of leeway to wrap up and then we'll, and then we'll put folks into mute and bring on the next uh, testifier. So unless there are any questions and it doesn't look like there are in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, oh, there is a question um, and, and it got answered in the chat, but we'll make sure that folks hear this. Can you please clarify, will the rest of the meeting be public comment or is there any further information that will be shared? The rest of the meeting is public comment. So if you don't wanna, if you're testifying and you know you don't want to need to stick around, we will not be presenting anything else except uh, closing thank yous. So you won't miss anything. So Andy, um, you've got the list of. Yeah, I will. I will just say we we do not have any hands raised yet. Okay. So um, I would expect that to change soon, and. Okay. If you are somebody who needs to, to leave early, we would be happy to kind of put you up in the queue if you would let us know that as well. But um, we are awaiting hands to be raised for commenters. I know nobody wants to be first. So I totally appreciate that. Uh, but um, if you have something to say, we're here to listen. And if folks don't need to use this opportunity, that's okay too, or you're gonna be submitting written comments, that's fine. But we wanna make sure everybody has a chance. And we do have one person on, on, a, on a phone. So I just, again, if you wanna do star nine to raise your hand, please don't hesitate. We'll give everybody a couple minutes. Okay, we've, we've got right. a few that are coming in. So it's gonna be uh, Mike Okwineski, followed by Charlie Plyman. Mike, you should get a little pop-up allowing you to speak and then you're good to go. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. First, I'd like to be sure of the quality of my um, vocal. You input. sound great, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a, I don't know if it's more of a question, but it, the term reasonable, foreseeable, action uh i i'm not entirely comfortable with it and i don't really know what it means but i mean we have a it's been mentioned many times that there's a big data gap or behind the effects of wind turbines and wind farms once they're out there plus the cumulative impact somewhere down the road but uh since these data gaps are really don't seem to have any way of collecting empirical data uh, without actually constructing at least one wind farm out there or something similar, is it uh, reasonably foreseeable then, as I, I take it, that they just bypass the data gaps and uh, not mention them at all? Or is there some other way of addressing this, these data gaps. And just one might be uh, effects on phytoplankton growth. Another might be the wind wakes that uh, wind and are gonna be coming up behind the turbines and possible wind deficit, or excuse me, energy deficits uh, as a, a plic, applies to the ocean itself as a driver of energy into the ocean. Things like that. There's a, I mean, there's a whole list. Temperatures, other things like that. Stratification. Um, the list goes on. So, if I could get a better understanding of what reasonably foreseeable means, 
I guess I, I, it would comfort me a little bit, I think. Meg, can you please stop the timer? Um, I want to, uh, uh, for folks and, and Mike, I, I appreciate that I'm using you a little bit as an example. Um, so for the public testimony piece, uh, this is not, a, generally there, there will be no response from us. We're just soliciting input at that at this point. And that is sometimes what makes these land use processes a little bit frustrating because this isn't an interactive, this is not interactive. This is us hearing from you. Um, so Mike, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take your question. I'm gonna ask Jeff to maybe just give an explanation of reasonably foreseeable. We're going to clear your clock, Mike, and then you can get back in the queue if you'd like to make comments once you've had his explanation. Uh, but for folks who are online, um, this is this is this is to receive testimony. So I'm glad you brought this up, Mike, because it might not be the only you're most likely not the only person with this question. And so I'm going to let Jeff answer and then we'll set the clock. We're going to move you down the list again, Mike, so you have some time to think about it. And then we'll move to Charlie, Doug, and then you, if, uh, if nobody else pops up for sure. So, Jeff? Um, so, thank you. Mike, to, I think there are two parts to how I would answer this question. Um, the first one is related to the action that's specifically before us now. You know, we are talking about leasing and survey activities. Baum could lease to could lease areas to a lessee and th that would be essentially an action taken at risk by a lessee that does not guarantee that a project would actually be built. So at this stage, I think our perspective has been that the effects related to a future existing offshore wind project are not applicable yet that that would come at the construction operations plan stage where we would look at what are the effects that we can foresee from the actual construction of a project and what is our state of uncertainty related to those effects and what information does the state require in order to understand the effects well enough to then compare those effects against our enforceable policies because if we don't have enough information about the effects, we can't very well compare them against policies that, that may have a bearing on those effects. And so the second part of my answer would be that my understanding of how federal consistency works is that the state is within its right to object to a project if there is insufficient information to establish the effects. It doesn't require perfect certainty, but it does require that there be some way to manage that uncertainty as I view it. And so we would, I think, really emphasize at that second review period that at the time something is brought to the state to review, there needs to be sufficient information to address those kinds of questions about effects that you were asking about. And I think I'm gonna just echo what I've heard Boehm say from time to time, which is that the survey activities that lessees want to conduct over the next five years would be in part to address some of those questions about effects. I hope that helps. Thank you, Jeff. It's a complicated, it's complicated, and we understand that. Um, and again, I, th I think that hearing people speak and, and hearing the presentation, some folks may like to might like to take advantage of the extra time to put thoughts in writing so that you can really think through all the stuff you've learned today. You've had a crash course in federal consistency and um, and um, it's, it is not easy. But what we want you to really focus on are some of the key points that Jeff pointed out in his presentation. And to his comment, don't um, don't feel like you can't bring up an issue. If you're not sure, that's fine. Say it. Um, well, you know, we're the ones that are going to make the decision whether or not it's applicable, but there may be a nugget in there that uh, we can pull out that you might otherwise think would not be applicable here. So just make your comments um, and try to stay, you know, try to stay focused and you have three minutes and um, 
I really appreciate uh, Mike kind of giving me the reminder that I needed to give a little bit more clarity on how public testimony is going to be moving forward. But this really will be the last time that we'll probably have an interaction with you uh, during this part of the phase, except to call people call people up to the to table to speak. So, um, Andy, I'm going to let you move into the next um, into the next person willing to willing be willing to testify, Charlie. I'm the first, I'm the next person wishing to testify. Go ahead. Yeah, Charlie, you should be able to speak. Uh, thanks, uh, Andy, Lisa, Jeff. Uh, great presentation. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, thumbs we, up. We hear you great. Great. Um, for the record, I'm Charlie Plyvin, uh, Organ Policy Manager with Surfrider Foundation. And um, I'm maybe just asking for additional resources or um, better information, uh, which may exist already, but I, I'm still a little unclear on sort of the, the site assessment um, and, character and, and characterization full activities. Like, what that exactly entails. They're kind of very generically described. And I'm hearing a lot from other places um, from around the country uh, to this, how that could or couldn't impact, um, for example, moorings and rocky habitat areas um, or sonar and how that's impacting wildlife or fisheries or isn't. Um, I feel like there's a lot of sort of information out there on that that isn't very well summarized for me in understanding what's best for what enforceable policies of the state do and don't apply. For example, how it may or may not impact a fishery just through exploring and site assessment and characterization. So I guess I'm asking for like any resources um, or better act understanding of these activities so we can sort of help better inform the conditions that we might recommend for the state. Um, and I guess in reading the federal determination I think particularly for my sort of recreation and tourism audience and interest, a lot of that's tabled for sort of the, the COP pay uh, portion of this process um, and, you know, not seeing, you know, exactly what is, is being built or proposed. I will say that it is foreseeable that something might be built and it could have an impact um, on the near shore. And I do have, you know, one of the only federal renewable energy lease areas permitted right in front of my house here. Um, and I, I, I remember very well how that process went and didn't go. And there's a lot of opportunity along the way um, to support end of the line impacted communities. And uh, many of those were addressed or weren't addressed in some of the pathway of development. And I think that there's some good examples to look to uh, when thinking through your roadmap process and moving forward. So um, thank you, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify and your leadership on this issue. Thank you, Carlin. Next. Yeah, next is Doug Hyken. Hi. Yeah, my name is Doug Hyken. I work for Oregon Wild, and I want to uh, preface my statement by saying that Oregon Wild is very concerned about climate change, and we do support aggressive actions to uh, build out renewable energy and try to address uh, the climate crisis. Uh, that said, I think this offshore wind proposal is extremely ambitious. And um, I think few people really understand what a huge um, you know, movement of capital into this region it, this involves. And um, our, our, our region is just not ready for it. Um, the, the ports are not prepared for it. Um, and the, the investments needed in those ports um, are going to help a few, but they are going to displace a lot of other port users. Um, other ocean users are going to be dramatically impacted. I think people really underestimate the effect of the um, offshore wind cabling system um, on marine mammals, such as whales and whale entanglement is a huge risk that we think is underappreciated. Um, and I don't see how we can make a rational decision about this without including all of the of the impacts in our in the scope of our analysis. You know, um, there there's going to be huge need for um, power line infrastructure onshore, um, and that's another big impact that 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 needs to be considered as part of this. Um, so I, um, I think one of the statements that our land use system stands for is making thoughtful and rational decisions about big projects like this. And I think when we consider all of the 
um, goals together, um, we need to, in, you know, encourage very thoughtful thinking about the overall project and whether or not it makes sense in this region and um, whether or not we're ready for it. And we also think that there are other alternative renewable energies that are very um, much more ripe and ready for implementation and cheaper. Um, onshore wind and solars, they certainly do have impacts on ecosystems. And uh, we're not, uh, you know, we're not ignorant of that. But we think they're much cheaper um, and much more ready to implement and can be done a lot quicker than uh, this project. That's all I got. Thank you, Doug. Next. Okay, we are circling back to Mike Okwineski. Well, uh, thank you for clarifying that as far as the question part. Um, I totally understand. I didn't know how to phrase it as a statement. Uh, but I just want to say thank you. I think it helped me understand a lot better of what the state's role is versus what I've seen Bohm's role has been. And uh, that to me has been, it's, it's important to hear that, I guess, from you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next. Next is uh, Ranfis. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ranfis Giannettino Viatoro. I'm the uh, Oregon Policy Manager with Blue Green Alliance. We're a national organization uh, aimed to address our environmental challenges while creating good quality jobs. Um, uh, again, I lead the state um, uh, table uh, for Blue Green Alliance. Uh, today, I just want to just share appreciation um, for each of you within DLCD and this presentation today, um, I think it's fairly uh, informative uh, and look forward to the presentations next week. Um, you know, additionally, just want to share and convey, you know, I think just the importance of one using, I think the best enforceable policies we have to set the tone for good, thoughtful and responsible um, engagement and just process um, ensuring that uh, any data or information being collected, it's transparent and shared broadly with community stakeholders. Um, you know, I think this is an important way to set the tone, not just for um, this process, but just in all pursuits of how we develop and explore uh, renewable energy development throughout the state and throughout the region. So I think the bar is set high and the expectations here are high, but I think the need here is high as well. Like I think uh, Oregon, has a state policy to meet its 100% clean energy mandate by 2040. Those challenges will be very difficult. Um, uh, but to get there, um, it's really going to continue to need to be have thoughtful, informative process. So I know there'll be really some key brass text questions that perhaps we won't get to unless there is a lease and a leasee and we get to the construction operations plan. So I might save my comments more down the road into the future, um, but optimistic um, that we can do this both in a thoughtful and a responsible way while creating good quality jobs and meeting our clean energy future. And those things don't need to be in contrast or in competition, um, but they, we can do we can do them all together. Um, so the bar is high set for um, you all DLCD, but uh, again, I just want to sort of encourage where we can through federal con state consistency review that the state of Oregon sets a high bar for deep engagement, transparency and data and information gathering. Um, and again, utilizing hopefully 4080 down the road, um, the roadmap as additional complementary area to address and identify key and tackle key questions that will be important for um, not just coastal community members, but for the whole state of Oregon. So with that, thank you again for um, this presentation. Thank you, Ramfi. This looks like that is the extent of folks with their hands raised. Cool. I'm going to give you um, uh, just a couple more seconds and then <laughs> I knew, I knew, I knew a stopwatch would get people going. Um, Andy? Yeah, uh, Steve Joner, uh, you should have a little pop-up allowing you to speak and be good to go. 
Hi, yeah, my name is Steve Joner. I work for the Macaw Tribe in uh, Washington. The tribe is located at the northwest uh, corner of uh, the Olympic Peninsula and is one of uh, 24 treaty tribes involved with the uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council process. And each one of these tribes has a very uh, uh, deep interest in what's happening with this offshore wind development, uh, primarily uh, because of the cumulative impacts that will have on the California current ecosystem uh, from the, the surveys, planning, construction, operation, line transmission, and so forth. And in particular, the direct impacts it will have on ocean processes such as upwelling. There's very little known about that. And uh, I know you've had a lot of communication with the Oregon tribes, and I just want to encourage you uh, in your consultation to consider the other tribes that have an interest here. Um, each one of these tribes uh, fishes salmon and, uh, you know, the ecosystem, of course, is, is critical to the survival and production of, of uh, salmon uh, that go into Oregon uh, streams, the Columbia River, Washington Coast, Puget Sound, and so on. And also there are four tribes in Northern Washington that have treaty rights to fish in the ocean, harvesting a variety of marine species. And a number of these species uh, are uh, uh, have larval stages in areas where uh, the offshore wind development will be occurring. And those fish migrate, uh, they, they grow, mature, migrate uh, north into the usual custom fishing grounds of of these coastal tribes. So even though uh, the tribes I'm speaking of, uh, the majority of them are not Oregon tribes, this development will be in federal waters. And um, the, the courts have made it clear that the treaty right also uh, includes the, the habitat, which must be protected in order for the tribes to have a meaningful treaty right. Um, you can probably talk to the folks at uh, ODFW to get contacts for each of the tribes, but I think uh, it'd be uh, much more appropriate to work with the tribes ahead of time than to try to deal with it once things get started and, um, and then uh, more uh, drastic measures need to be taken. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next. Yeah, next we have Scott Strickland. Hello, thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak. For the record, my name is Scott Strickland and I'm Special Projects Counsel for SMART Local 16, representing over 2000 sheet metal workers across the state of Oregon and Southwest Washington. Um, I just wanted to quickly comment and, and say that we're really excited about the opportunity to create good union jobs for coastal residents and other residents across the state, across a broad swath of different communities and folks representing all kinds of intersectionality. That's really what makes Oregon amazing and wonderful. Um, that we really support responsible engagement in the process that goes above and beyond uh, what the federal government requires. And I'm already beginning to see a lot of that here. And I really respect and appreciate that. Um, and, and to say that we're really hopeful in DLCD's capacity to protect Oregon's interests and ocean users um, and create opportunities for workers, that this is really an exciting time. This is a kind of generation defining issue that we're dealing with and that we tackle this in a responsible way that, that respects the rights of all community members, including organized labor. So thank you. Great. Uh, anyone else, Andy? Not yet, Lisa. Again, if you would like to speak, please raise your hand or press star nine if you are on the phone. All right. We have uh, Rick Eichstadt followed again by Mike. Rick, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, Ann. I uh, 
my voice is a bit off. I have a bad cold. <laughs> Sorry to um, hear that. My name's Rick Eidstead. I'm an attorney for the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower and Sayusla Indians. Uh, I appreciate the uh, uh, public hearings that DLCD is uh, holding on this really important matter. And uh, as uh, DLCD know, uh, undoubtedly knows, uh, my client, C.T. Clusey, went uh, initially from uh, cautiously supportive of offshore wind to uh, opposing uh, this project, in large part because of the uncertainties associated uh, with it, uh, the unwillingness of uh, BOEM to engage in meaningful consultation, uh, and, and frankly, uh, the, the process is appears to be largely politically driven to try to get uh, leases in place before uh, the election. So uh, we appreciate DLCD's uh, willingness to uh, take a thoughtful look at, uh, at project impacts. <clears throat> the tribe also appreciates uh, DLCD's uh, willingness to uh, engage in consultation and look forward to uh, the meeting uh, that's upcoming. And then uh, I know this is something that I have posed to uh, DLCD staff is um, it's worth pointing out that at this point, even for the survey work associated with this stage of the project, there is no cultural resource um, National Historic Preservation Act agreement of any type in place that would cover uh, any impacts associated with, um, excuse me, with uh, any of the survey work that uh, is associated with uh, with this stage of the project. So I think that's something uh, in its consistency review that DLCD should uh, uh, certainly consider uh, the cultural resource impacts uh, that potentially could occur uh, with, with the stage of the project we're at. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, normally, uh, uh, individuals coming up have uh, one shot at the at the mic. Uh, but Mike, um, I, I will I will let you uh, speak one more time since you've only taken a few seconds each time, and then we'll ask if there are anybody if anybody else would like to speak, and then we will close the testimony if there is no other uh, testimony to be provided today. So, Mike, well, thank you again. Um... Steve Joners expressed something that Heather Mann, myself, and a lot of others in the fishing industry have talked about. And the life cycle of many of these fish can start out in California and then come through the Northwest or through Oregon on their way into Canada. Hake is, uh, is one of those. But um, spawning areas and things like that, uh, ocean transport of uh, larvae and Dungeness crab is pretty important from what I understand. So Steve brings up some really good points. I just wanted to somewhat reinforce what he had to say because I think it's something that needs to be looked at pretty carefully. And especially with the tribes because they actually have rights to fish that are born outside of their UNAs but come through their UNAs at a later stage in life. So thank you. All right, um, that looks like that's it on our um, hands raised. I'm gonna put out one more call and then I think we can let folks go. Oh, uh, that is a great question, Anne. Um, uh, we had a question in the chat about when this was gonna be posted, this recording, and we're looking at sometime next week. Um, so you can be on the lookout for that. It'll be on our website and Andy, is there somewhere else that they'll be able to access it? Yes, Lisa, when it's published, it will um, come through on DLCD's YouTube channel, um, but it will also be made available uh, via our offshore wind leasing webpage. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, we really appreciate you sticking with us. Um, we hope that these presentations were helpful in clarifying where we're at, at least now in the process, uh, that you have something to look forward to as the roadmap process kicks off. 
and then hopefully we'll be seeing many of you at the in-person meetings uh, next week. And again, we'll be in Brookings on the 3rd, uh, Coos Bay on the 4th, Florence on the 6th, and Newport on the 7th. So all of those are evening meetings. So if you have an opportunity, it would be great to see you. And um, unless there, we have any other parting comments, I think that we will wrap this up. I'd like to thank all the staff that's here today to help make this as smooth as possible. And of course, all of you for your timely and very, very kind, respectful testimony, very thoughtful testimony. We really appreciate it. So with that, I think we can close today's webinar. Thank you, everyone.